Yesterday, President Muhammad Buhari sacked two ministers in his cabinet summarily. According to him, Mohamed Sabo Nanono, former agriculture minister and his counterpart in the power ministry, Saleh Maman, were removed in order to reinvigorate the cabinet in a manner that would deepen his capacity to consolidate legacy achievements. In their place, the incumbent environment minister, Mohamed Abubakar, was named the new agriculture minister, while the minister of state for works and housing, Abubakar Aliyu, took over in the power ministry. The president also promised to make changes to his cabinet a continuous process to discuss the sudden cabinet changes and what to expect as the president enters a race against time to change the narrative on his stewardship. We're now being joined from Abuja by Mamou Jega, Arise News Public Affairs Analyst and Editor-in-Chief of 21st Century Chronicle. Good morning, Mamoud, and welcome to The Morning Show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Oga Ruben. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Well, very quickly, you had my uh, introduction. Uh, what do you make of these uh, changes in the cabinet? Uh, do you think that uh, it's uh, something we should be excited about, particularly as uh, the presidency has promised us that this will be a continuous process? Well, uh, as uh, many people have observed, you see, uh, in Nigeria, cabinet reshuffles used to be quite uh, regular under both military and civilian administrations. Almost at the onset of every anniversary, the newspapers will be awash with speculation as to which changes are coming and who is going and who is coming into the cabinet. But... Uh, Presidents have their own style. President Buhari, uh, in his six years as president, does not uh, seem to like uh, making uh, personnel changes, especially in the cabinet. This is almost the first uh, cabinet uh, reshuffle in more than six years of the Buhari presidency. And uh, in the end, only two ministers were dropped from the cabinet and uh, their portfolios were filled by other serving uh, ministers. So many people would say probably that uh, it didn't go far enough. And in any case, uh, as you observed, time is really uh, running out because there is less than two years now for the ministers who are put in new portfolios to make a very big impact because Within air also, the politics of 2023's succession, succession will set in and it will be even very difficult to achieve uh, very much. Well, why do you think that the president actually effected this sack of two ministers, highly uncharacteristic, like you said? What do you think has finally brought this on and what do you expect to see next? Well, uh, the only indication as to the reason why these two ministers were dropped in the presidential statement signed by Femi Adeshina was that it followed a certain sectoral review of performances at the Federal Executive Council meeting. What that suggests is that these two ministers probably presented their reports and the reports were not very impressive. Uh, that, that's the only suggestion you get from the presidential statement. And uh, it, uh, if that was the case, it seems to accord with the reality because really in both the agricultural sector and in the power sector under the two now former ministers, well, agriculture probably made uh, many strides in the last uh, six years, not necessarily due to the minister who has just uh, departed because there was a lot of uh, intervention, especially by the central bank in some sectors like rice growing and lending and other things. But the minister who has just been removed, uh, Nanono, uh, he didn't seem to have the right vision of agriculture and uh, he was always on the defensive in his media engagements and he was also given to making some some, some gaffes uh, in his uh, statements uh, and called for ones, like uh, when it was suggested to him that food prices are high and rising, he said, no, that is not true in Kano. Uh, 
uh, where he comes from, that you can eat with 30 naira. Uh, that was a very unfortunate uh, statement, and uh, of the social media people played it up and were making practical jokes, going to restaurants in Kano with 30 naira and demanding <laughs> uh, to eat. So he didn't seem to be in the, in the right place. As for power, uh, from the beginning, maybe uh, Salim Oman shouldn't have been in power because I don't think he had any experience in that sector. Power is probably the most problematic, uh, <laughs> possibly after security, of all the sectors in Nigeria. And if a man like uh, Fashola <laughs> in four years could make very little impact in the power sector, uh, one would have expected uh, a major, a thorough professional with deep knowledge of the sector or at least a lot of engineering and project management experience to have been assigned to that sector. So uh, Salim Mama seemed to be quite uh, lightweight uh, to be given such a major responsibility and it's not very surprising that uh, in the end he made very little uh, impact and has to be shown the way out. But unfortunately, uh, it took more than two years. So the person who has come in, I don't know really what you can do to the power sector within two years, but he can try. So uh, you said something. You said the, uh, Mr. Nono didn't have you know, a grand vision for the agri sector. The question that comes to my mind, is he supposed to have the vision or the administration is supposed to set the vision for him? I mean, how does the ideation start as regards a vision in what the ministry should be? Should it be incumbent on the minister? And you also talked about the fact that, yeah, we'll have had a, a big power player if a minister like uh, 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 Fashola you know, you know, had problems with power, then we'll have put in somebody higher profile. But I put it to you that people always failed in the power sector. So is it really about who is the minister or the government? And I'll give you instances. You know, the great Bolaige was, had, was, was you know, removed from the power ministry and put into another ministry at a point. If someone like Batonaji couldn't crack the power ministry in this country, then who can crack it? So, so these are the challenges on ground. I agree with you. I agree with you that uh, there is a system, systemic uh, problem, but as to the question of vision, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the vision should start at the highest level. The president uh, and the administration as a whole should set a general vision. But within that, you still need people with the right experience and uh, the right capacity to also drive the vision because it's one thing to, to, to articulate a vision on paper and quite another thing to deliver on it. And if you assign a portfolio to a person who has had the experience or the requisite uh, qualification so that his learning process will be short or shorter, mm, it shouldn't take six months or one year. If you put a power engineer probably in the power sector, then within two, three months, he would have, uh, he will be on top of the intricacies. But, you know, I had only a small part of the discussion that you had previously because I was uh, on the road. And uh, one part that I entirely agree with is that probably at the level of confirmation, it will help in this country if we borrow the American system where ministers are nominated together with the portfolios that they are going to. So that in the screening process in the Senate, a person will be thoroughly grilled about his vision uh, and his competencies to handle a particular sector. Uh, but uh, right now, the screening process is more or less a sham because since the senators don't know uh, which portfolio a ministerial nominee is going to have, they just ask some general questions uh, about uh, various things, and uh, the next thing we hear that he's going to social portfolio, we were unable to grill him about his vision and his understanding of the problems in that sector. So maybe that is one area that we can make an improvement. The fact that when the president nominates ministers now, he says that this one is going to power, this one is going to work, this one is going to justice, it does not uh, take away his power along the way to change them to drop them if necessary, or to reshuffle them. 
uh, as he sees fit. But it will help in the screening process to ensure that we put the right uh, round pegs in round holes instead of probably what seems to uh, happen now. Well, uh, two quick things. Uh, the first is, uh, yes, we've been mm. talking about Nanono and uh, Saleh Mahmoud. But how about these two uh, replacements? Mm. Engineer uh, Dr. Mohamed Abubakar, as Minister of uh, Environment, he, mm. it's not as if he did anything mm. significant in that uh, you know, Ministry of Environment, except some occasional uh, statements mm. about uh, Nigeria's commitment to climate change. What is the guarantee that he will do mm. better as uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture? The other person, Engineer Abubakar Aliyu, uh, who is now uh, the Minister of uh, Power from Works. Well, I mean, an engineer, do you necessarily need a power engineer to be able to make progress in the energy sector? Or you need to get the right policy framework in place, particularly with regard to transmission, generation, distribution, and to make sure that, look, uh, the value chain in the uh, electricity sector uh, is properly uh, deepened and defined. Otherwise, we'll have a repeat. We may not have uh, uh, any, uh, you know, except you know something that we do not know about these two <laughs> new min newly redeployed ministers. <laughs> I don't know anything that you do not know. I agree that there is some little advantage in having an engineer as a minister of uh, power, just a little, because, you know, uh, this is a sector full of uh, engineers, and professionals like that tend to dazzle uh, political leaders uh, with uh, jargon and the figures and they get you lost in order to hide their various uh, selfish uh, interests. I'm not saying all of them, but uh, many of them. Which, for the same reason that probably it helps if you have a medical doctor as Minister of Health, because otherwise he could get lost in the medical Juggle. But but that's not uh, all there is to it. Uh, the Minister of Power is not the one who is going to uh, run the transformers and uh, connect uh, the way. So more importantly, what you need is somebody with the uh, requisite uh, overall experience and capacity to monitor and to drive projects and to engineer people and to set targets and to be dynamic enough to monitor and to whip people uh, in place. But uh, I agree entirely that, you know, the problem of the power sector uh, is more than ministerial. The, the, the minister himself, there is a limit to what he can do. The country as a whole has to, uh, I mean, the administration as a whole has to accord the right priority attention. And the president himself has to devote a lot of attention and uh, energy and also resources and guidance and monitoring for a problematic sector uh, like that. Uh, the Minister of uh, Environment who was moved to agriculture, I agree also possibly that his uh, record at the Ministry of Environment was not uh, entirely stellar. And uh, agriculture uh, is a very, very difficult uh, portfolio. It has the largest uh, number uh, of employed uh, people in Nigeria, millions and millions with all kinds of uh, problems. So I don't really know his uh, overall capacity, but we will see it uh, very quickly if he begins by articulating the right vision and the right uh, programs. It will help, of course, if he receives uh, proper guidance from the presidency as to objectives and the aims. Otherwise, he too would be just uh, swimming. But uh, I, on the whole, you know, one has uh, cause to worry because like we were saying, about uh, fascia, you see, if it is uh, at the level of uh, knowledge and experience and what we see of personal commitment and dynamism, it is difficult in Nigeria to have a technocrat bigger than uh, fascia. And he himself, uh, in four years, was uh, really having serious problems with the power sector, and he more or less left it as he, as he met it, like one former military governor said. So, so it requires uh, a major, major uh, rethinking of what to do in the sector like that, beyond mere reshuffling of ministers. The new minister of power, he was a deputy uh, governor, 
uh, in, in, in Yobe State for about 10 years. And he was also Minister of State uh, in, under Fashola in the last two years. So that's some uh, good experience. But whether it is enough to cope with the challenges of the power sector, we'll have to see. And also there isn't much time. I want your take on Section 147 of the Constitution, which requires that the ministers must come from all states in the country and the FCT. It limits the president with regards to his options. Mm. He doesn't get to trawl the whole country for the best people, necessarily. It all depends on federal character. Mm. I want your take on that. And what, do you, what would you prefer to see if we're able to have a constitutional amendment? Okay, uh, the, the section you refer to, which uh, mandates a president to nominate ministers, at least one minister from every state. You see, that is uh, another phase of uh, federal character and uh, zoning and other things. It is okay if you ask me because, like some professors argued 40 years ago when we first adopted these uh, provisions in the Constitution, anything that will help to ensure peace in the polity is very important because otherwise if you have a situation where some sections of the country are disenchanted and disaffected and you don't have peace, then even if you have the best technocrats in place, they may not be able to achieve anything. Okay, the second part of it is that right now in Nigerian politics, there are professionals from almost every sector. In, in politics, active partisan politics in Nigeria now, you see diplomats, former diplomats, you see army generals, you see retired police uh, commissioners and DIGs and AIGs, even IGs, a lot of retired civil servants and permanent secretaries. You have lawyers, you have doctors, you have engineers, a lot of professors in Nigerian politics. So even if the president has to choose from within the ranks of politicians, and that one is probably necessary because the way we do politics in Nigeria now, it's not possible for you to be elected president or governor and to say, no, uh, forget about all the people who run around campaigning. I'm going to look for the best technocrats. If you do that, probably there will be nobody standing for you the next time you are running for election. But as I said, that is okay because within the ranks of the politicians themselves, and also despite the provision that you must source ministers from every state of the federation, you can still get a lot of very good material within those limits. So I think in the end, it is incumbent upon a president who is making the choices to still source for the best material within the constraints of having to choose from every state and within the constraints of having to choose practicing uh, politicians. Although, you know, you can still have a few uh, technocrats that you can choose. Uh, since uh, 1999, presidents have shown the capacity to do that. And you can say, well, so, so, one or two, three, four ministries, I need some of the best technocrats. Even if they are Nigerians in diaspora, I can get them, provided you don't bring too many of them. You may not have too much problem with your fellow uh, politicians. So I think those ones are constraints, but they are not uh, completely overwhelming. We can still make very good choices within those constraints. So I'd like to ask, is that like a monthly index that ranks performance of ministers? And do they get like a monthly deliverables, KPIs and all of that? Who are they even accountable in the first, to in the first place? I don't know the exact uh, monitoring mechanism in the presidency. Maybe monthly uh, performance indicators may be a bit too stressful for ministers. Maybe quarterly would be better because uh, the ministers do a lot of meetings and a lot of traveling and the Federal Executive Council meeting is every Wednesday which itself is disorganizing. Uh, in the days of the military in the 1980s it used to be monthly and I thought uh, that was not uh, bad. Maybe now because the Federal Executive Council has taken certain responsibilities which I don't think is its own, like all this award of contracts which dominates uh, the meetings. In the olden days, we used to have the tenders board at the federal level and at the state uh, levels, and those ones took most of the responsibility for the award uh, of contracts. And now we even have due process and uh, 
other offices. So I think if the Federal Executive Council is shown of that responsibility, it does not have to meet uh, too often. It could meet once a month for overall policy direction and also monitoring and possibly a quarterly or even six monthly assessment of ministerial performance is not uh, out of place. Monthly might be too much. Uh, that one is for maybe secondary school uh, students or the uh, junior workers. That's my own uh, take anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Earlier on, you said, uh, you know, you align with the view that the uh, reshuffle, as they call it, uh, does not go far enough. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to make suggestions, which other ministries do you think that the ministers have overstayed their welcome? And when uh, Femi Adishino says this will be a continuous, <laughs> when Femi Adishino says this will be a continuous <laughs> process, how continuous can that process be, considering the fact that there is a sense of urgency, um, you know, around the country in terms of government's uh, performance, and the government itself has less than a year actually before uh, the entire country locks into uh, a 2023 general election mode. By which point. Uh, you know, there will be less attention paid to uh, governance and more paid to politics. I agree, I agree uh, honestly, that there is very little time for the continuous reshuffle that was promised in the... You know, uh, I remember, for example, when President Eradua marked his first anniversary in 2008, he dropped 20 ministers out of 42. Uh, although at the time, as newspaper people, we said that was, that was too much. After only one year, you shared half of the uh, cabinet, but possibly because there was a problem in the selection uh, process. Now, to drop uh, two ministers after six years, I don't know really how long it will take before more. Certainly, there are many, many other sectors in the federal government where the performance is uh, less than uh, to the satisfaction or the expectation of Nigerians. But you see uh, another problem, like we are saying now, the two new ministers that were moved to agriculture and uh, power. Uh, honestly, it's almost not fair to them to say that they have two years to make a major impact. And those two years, at least half of it is going to be consumed by politics. Now, any time after this, let's say in October or December, if you do any more changes, that will be even more unfair to the person that you give an important portfolio and ask him to have some uh, major impact because time will really, really be against him. So maybe the president could have done a lot more changes at this stage, identify all the sectors, maybe like 10 most problematic uh, sectors and affect uh, the changes, but anything going further down the road will make things even more uh, difficult, I think. Well, I recall uh, detailed accounts given by the President's Senior Special Advisor on Media and Publicity, Femi Adishino, in his blog last February, talking about Judgment Day, when all the ministers had to present their performance reviews to the President, and how one minister is the one who stood tall, and that was um, Babatunde Fashala, and that others, by the time the President was done with them, were like rain-beaten chickens, which is quite evocative, that language, which is why it's hard to forget. Why is it then that if you berate people to they're in the state of a rain-beaten chicken, that they get to keep their jobs? Well, uh, I remember the late president of Sierra Leone once said that uh, appointing ministers and retaining them is my prerogative under the Constitution, <laughs> and I exercise it uh, as I see fit. That was what Siaka Stevens once told a BBC interviewer. Well, if it is the president's prerogative to appoint, to retain, or to sack, then the electorate probably uh, to whom the president is answerable will also factor that uh, into consideration in their overall assessment of the administration and the presidency. But I think it does a lot of good for any president to listen to the public feeling and the expectations and to make changes where public opinion suggests that uh, 
a minister is an ill fit or is not uh, performing uh, uh, optimally, or to even send him to a place where he may perform better if probably he is there, uh, it is not his uh, natural uh, 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 fault. It is important because uh, public impression is very important and based on the lack of performance in one or two sectors, especially the sectors that people have direct connection with, let's say like roads. If the roads are very poor, potholed everywhere, people could uh, really just write off uh, an administration entirely. Uh, I am not saying the present Minister of Works is not uh, performing. And also, uh, Oga Ruben, I'm not going to take your bait and begin suggesting which uh, ministries uh, need change at this time because the Constitution didn't give me that prerogative. It gave to the president, so let him exercise it. <laughs> right? So th there have been some thoughts mm -hmm. that since most of these ministers work in ministry and those ministries have full set up civil service structure, that how about having a system in place where you pick the ministers from that civil service structure. Maybe it will bring about you know, effectiveness in running those ministries. Is that a possibility sometime soon in the future? Because they've worked on it all their lives. And if we can do the same for MDAs, why can't we do the same as ministers? You, you know, uh, in the 1980s, when the Babangida regime uh, tried to take away the accounting officer role from permanent secretaries and director generals and give it to ministers. There was all this argument uh, about civil servants who are better as accounting officers and this and that. And uh, Babangida argued at the time that civil servants are not more patriotic than any other uh, people. And I think since then, the situation is much worse. I don't think many people will agree with you now that we should put uh, civil servants in overall charge because honestly, the level of corruption and the waste and the mismanagement and misdirection and selfishness in the civil service is probably at its highest level since uh, independence. And I don't think there will be any quality improvement if matters are left entirely at the hands of the civil servants, at least the ones that we have now. So injecting people from outside actually has its own merit, if only you inject uh, the right kind of uh, people. As we said, there is still a lot of room for improvement in the selection of people to serve in ministerial portfolios, even despite the constraints imposed by the practical uh, considerations that you have to choose from among the ranks of politicians and also that you must choose at least one person from every state. Despite those constraints, there is still a huge pool of talented people from all walks of life within the political class in Nigeria at this time that we can choose from if we choose very carefully and then also consider the matter of putting square pegs in square holes and as we said, we can improve upon that by nominating people and mentioning the portfolio that they are going to so that the Senate will be able to screen them against the portfolio that they are to be assigned with. It will help. It will not cure all the problems, but it will probably be an improvement on the current practice. Well, I mean, in the course of this conversation, you've referred to uh, former Governor Fashola about twice or so. And, uh, you know, that's like mm -hmm. saying at least this is one person that you can identify who has been making a very good effort. Beyond the uh, two uh, ministers that have been dropped, we're talking generally about performance at the ministerial level. Do you know any other persons, like maybe two or three more out of all these uh, ministers uh, serving Nigerians that you can say, well, I think this one is also making an effort beyond Fashola because... Is more or less the only person that most people were mentioned. Even Fashola, uh, most of our assessment of him was from his previous uh, career as governor of Lagos State, where by all accounts he was uh, visionary and uh, dynamic and very high performing. I don't think uh, his performance as minister 
in the last uh, six years has met the level of his performance as governor of Lagos State. But then, you know, you can make excuses and say, well, a minister is not the chief executive. He also has various constraints. Uh -huh. About other ministers, there are some that I think probably if they are given more challenging portfolios could do better. I'm thinking of, for example, Dr. Ogbonaya Onu. I happen to know him as a young journalist when he was governor of Abia State in the Third Republic. And I remember interviewing him and also saw him uh, on television that time discussing some industrial uh, projects. And he appeared to me to be extremely uh, capable and also level-headed when he was chairman of the AMPP. The science and technology portfolio in Nigeria does not appear to be a very challenging uh, portfolio. And I thought a man like that, if he were put in a more challenging position, could probably do better. There are other examples, but uh, I, I cannot think of all of them right now. But this is one person I had been thinking about for quite uh, some time. Well, I mean, you are more or less in the same place as many Nigerians. Uh, if they were asked to name up to five ministers, they probably would be str struggling with it. Uh, but uh, as for Dr. Ono that you mentioned, was he not the minister that said uh, we're going to set up a pencil manufacturing factory as a major contribution to science and innovation? The very same. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much, Mamou Jega, for joining us. I remember it was <laughs> kind of, yes. We're still waiting for that pencil factory. <laughs> thank you very much, Mamou Jega, for joining us this week.